Hi guys, so a couple of things. We're getting ready to start the new um, era of Baroque in Northern Europe. But before we do, I just wanted to give you a little encouragement. I know it's that time of the semester where we sort of all start slogging through the semester and it can just really feel um, heavy, uh, like your course load is heavy and like you're never going to get through it. I promise you will. Um, I just want to tell you that if you need help, please remember that I'm here to help you with the material. Um, so please reach out if you're struggling. Remember that uh, even though the semester feels like it's half over, you still have 75% of the points available to you to make your grade be what you want it to be. Um, midterm grades did go out last week. However, exam one wasn't calculated in that midterm grade. So I don't feel that the midterm grade is really a true reflection of how you're doing in the course. Uh, so look at your exam one grades as I get them graded. Uh, I appreciate your patience as um, I grade them. I will scan them and email them back to you. So look for an email from me that has your midterm markup exam in it. And um, that should help you get a better grade on the next exam and show you what you did well and maybe some things that you need to work on. The 17th century was the golden age of Dutch art and culture when exploration, colonization, science, and technology shaped new perceptions of the world. Scientific advancements like the microscope and telescope encouraged a direct, first-hand study of nature. Even the newly accepted Copernican theory that the Earth revolves around the Sun contributed to a spirit of rational observation. Under these revolutionary influences, a new style of art emerged, which reflected a growing fascination with the actual world. At the beginning of the century, the provinces of the Netherlands were colonies of Catholic Spain. Within a few years, the northern provinces, including modern-day Holland, succeeded in liberating themselves and setting up a Protestant republic. But Flanders in the south remained under Spanish rule. There, in what is Belgium today, power and money were concentrated in the hands of the crown and the Catholic Church. Together, these formidable institutions all but monopolized Flemish art, resulting in commissions for grand, large-scale works suitable for palaces, public halls, and cathedrals. In the New Dutch Republic, however, there were few palaces, and in the Calvinist churches, iconoclasts, or image breakers, had swept away religious imagery in favor of bare, unadorned walls. But for their own homes and public buildings, the prosperous Dutch eagerly sought paintings of all kinds, from still lives to portraits to genre paintings and seascapes, giving rise to some of the greatest artist careers of the day. Vermeer, Rembrandt, Frans Hals, and Jan Steen are but a few of the names that evoke the golden age of Dutch painting. Their work is an enduring testament to the great wealth and appreciation for art that dominated the Netherlands at the time. So we're going to start um, Northern Baroque in the in Flanders. Uh, we refer to that as the um, Flemish group of people, um, but we're also going to look at the Dutch. So the Dutch people are free from Spanish rule. Um, they practice the Protestant faith. This creates a merchant middle class. Civic groups are commissioning portraiture and wealth comes from trade and agriculture. Um, land ownership is really important. The Catholic Church, who has launched the, launched the Counter-Reformation, and the Protestant Church, who launched the Reformation, are in full battle as to who is the right philosophy in this debate about art and theology. The Protestant Church has banned art altogether, and the Catholic Church is embracing it. Baroque art pushes realism by capturing split-second timing and having art that interacts with the viewer. 
the Dutch create small merchants uh, that begin with the first that begin the first modern art galleries. Um, the first modern art galleries were basically artists that sold their paintings and their art on the street. So today, if you go to New York City and you're in, say, Central Park, you'll see lots of artists that sell their art um, in Central Park along the street. Those were the very first modern art galleries. Um, they were places that uh, the middle class were able to sell their wares um, because the church is no longer uh, producing or commissioning art for the Protestant churches, um, the Dutch at times don't have business. The church is the main patron that we've looked at since the beginning of early Renaissance. And so because of that, it creates a situation where the Dutch artist is very much a struggling artist. Here's a map of Europe during the Reformation. Do you notice the pink spots that are sort of engulfed by uh, land that's colored in yellow? These are Protestant lands. Um, they're lands that surra are surrounded by Catholic lands. Remember, the monarchy is tied to a religion so that the ruling, ruling power uh, declares the faith of the country. All of the pink, green, and blue countries are Protestant. Yellow lands are Catholic. Um, Flanders and the Dutch areas are lands that uh, you see the arrow pointing to. So now that you understand a little bit more about Dutch, the Dutch and Flanders, uh, you'll see that our next Flemish master goes completely against the grain. He owns a studio in Antwerp, um, and Antwerp at the time is Catholic. So the new Catholic Church needs art, and Rubens is just the guy who's going to do that. Um, he was the director of an enormous workshop, and he was well-educated. He was so well-liked by patrons and the royal court that he was knighted five times by local monarchs. He spends eight years in Italy. He is a Flemish artist by training. Um, his style reflects Van Eyck and the attention to surfaces and the preciseness of the Flemish tradition, but he also trains in Italy for about eight years. While he's in Italy, he's exposed to the great wonders of classical antiquity, like the Laocoon. Um, he would have seen Michelangelo's work there. He would have seen Raphael's work there. Um, and he's very smitten with the high Renaissance masters. He favors the compositions that Titian um, creates using those big, heavy-looking pyramids. He likes the pyramidal composition of Raphael's work and Michelangelo's work. So when we look at Rubens' art, you can easily see the Italian influence um, from the Italian masters like Caravaggio's Tenebrism. Uh, while Rubens doesn't use the full-fledged Tenebrism, he definitely... Um, uses the chiaroscuro that is favored by the Italian artists. We get a lot of viewer participation um, because the figures are placed at such dramatic angles. They feel as if they interact with the viewer's space. And you can see the Herculean style figures that are reflected um, from Rubens study in Italy, those Herculean style figures were um, a stylistic hallmark of Michelangelo's. We also see a passage of time. We know that um, time has passed in the central scene um, because they're getting ready to put the uh, cross into the ground um, it's smack dab in the middle of them trying to hoist the cross up. 
and place it into the ground. And so that split second timing feels as if there was a photograph being taken place. They, that's the kind of design that you only get um, through a picture, typically. You can see the um, major angle that Rubens uses to create drama. Um, the Herculean figures also accentuate that drama uh, because they are so dramatic looking. He places the red throughout the painting in very strategic ways to help move your eyes through the scene to talk of the biblical stories. The bodies in the central scene create an eccentric pyramid. That is the influence of Titian um, and Christ is modeled off of the Laocoon that Peter Paul Rubens would have seen in Italy. For Rubens, all of the Flemish and Italian ideas come together. And Rubens becomes an advocate for the aristocracy and for Catholicism. Um, he also believes in the divine right to rule. Um, Marie de Medici, who was the Queen of France, sees uh, Rubens' work and commissions a slew of paintings, uh, hoping that she will convince the French people that she has the divine right to rule. I just um, wanted to isolate the central panel here so you could really see the chiaroscuro that happens in the um, center of the panel uh, with the turning of the Herculean figures, arms and musculature. Uh, you see the guy, the main guy that's supporting the weight of Jesus's lower half as they hoist the body into or hoist the cross into the ground. Um, you can see the legs of that Herculean figure and how very muscular they are. He uses these rich, um, colors that are very dramatic when they're placed, um, very strategically throughout the composition. That is very much a trademark of Titian's, uh, so I ask you at the bottom here if you can pick out what it is in this painting that is so very real. And as you sit and dissect it, I think you'll see how um, dramatized Rubens has made the scene. Okay, so this is Peter Paul Rubens' arrival of Marie de Medici. Um, as you know, Marie de Medici is Italian. She comes from the famous line of Medici's, um, but she comes to France to marry King Henry of France, and she's actually kind of a boring woman. There's nothing exciting about her in terms of her personality. She's just kind of blah, and so she asks Rubens to paint a portrait of her arriving into France, and the French people welcoming her into France um, and to make it seem as if her rule was a divine pick of God. Um, remember this time France is Catholic and they're in the thick of the argument of the Protestant Reformation. If any of you watched the show Rain, um, this is the Marie de Medici that uh, is married to King Henry and um, is the one who is one of the stars of that TV show. So the thing that is really quite beautiful in this piece is that Rubens combines religion with mythology seamlessly. At the bottom of the painting, you can see um, King Neptune and the mermaids uh, welcoming Marie de Medici on the ship. Um, obviously the ship is sailing through the water and, um, it's the idea that the gods are blessing her arrival. Um, the women in Rubens' paintings are always very voluptuous. In fact, if someone were to come to you and say you're very Rubenesque, he's actually telling you you're fat. 
Um, but he really loved voluptuous women. He liked them to be fleshy, and he paints them as if so differently men. When you look at the men, they have a hard sense to them. You can see the sense of um, every muscle ripple. They're very, um, they just, they look like they bodybuilders, whereas the women are these soft, voluptuous things, and you can almost sense the pillowiness and the softness of the skin um, just by the way the light is captured and how he paints the light on the female body. Um, you can see in the right-hand corner the women that have um, long hair that are Neptune's um, mermaids or goddesses and they are pulling the ship into the harbor and blessing Marie de Medici's arrival. As well you can see his use of the great diagonal and the Herculean man to the lower right hand side of the canvas that is holding the pole that sticks straight out at the viewer kind of helps to capture the viewer into the painting. Um, Maria de Medici has this beautiful softness to her. That soft style, once again, was borrowed from Titian. So this painting is one that your textbook kind of focuses on. So I wanted to put it in here uh, to explain some more about Rubens' style. Uh, you can see that the title of the work of art is Prometheus Bound. Um, and so Rubens uses a classical myth, myth to illustrate a narrative. Um, I don't know the myth of Prometheus. If I remember, uh, I don't know. He's being punished by the gods and the animals are eating him, I think. Um, point being is that Rubens harkens back to classical mythology in order to illustrate his um, ideas or lessons or morals that we as society need to fall back on. Additionally, you can see the t Italian influence of the Ignuti um, from Michelangelo. Uh, if you remember, the Ignudis are those figures that um, are nude and they're overly Herculean in their um, physique. In other words, they have lots of muscles. They look very much like they're competing for the Mr. World Cup. Um, and so you take Ruben's style and you see that he falls back on Roman ideology by using the myths, and he falls back on um, his training in Italy for the style of body that he represents. He does, however, represent the Flemish school of thought by creating such detail in the surface textures of the painting. So you can see in this Herculean figure how very realistic the body's muscles look. You understand the um, texture of the skin compared to the texture of the wings of the eagle. Um, if it weren't on a two-dimensional surface, one would think that this work of art was um, a very realistic work of art because of the texture of the feathers in the eagle, because of the texture in the trees. Um, and you see how the background goes way beyond uh, just the surface or just the figures that are in the foreground. You can see a background that goes very, very far. That's an Italian influence as well in terms of um, representing that depth of field or the space that Rubens is trying to represent. Um, in addition to, he's seen Caravaggio's work. Um, Caravaggio utilizes those very um, extreme angles. That's what makes this work of art so very Baroque, is that the angle that Rubens lays Prometheus at 
is um, done in a way that it jets out into the viewer's space. And so it communicates a dynamic sense of motion. That dynamic sense of motion um, is something that draws the viewer in and pulls the viewer into the painting. Uh, because of that, this painting has a very dramatic feel to it. Remember that Rubens picked that up from Titian in Italy. Van Dyck is known for his portraiture. Um, by the age of 20, Van Dyck had his own commissions um, aside from his assistantship with Rubens. He, because he was so well known for his portraiture, the aristocracy uh, really propelled Ruben or er, Anthony Van Dyke's career. Most of the aristocracy hires him to um, paint images of the aristocracy, uh, paint portraits of the aristocracy. So Van Dyck is skillful at creating the type of portrait that is able to flatter the sitter. Um, most of his portraiture makes the uh, sitters seem more attractive, more wealthy, more lofty, and more powerful and wealthy. Um, he accentuates their wealth and power um, in the poses that he stands in. Um, there's a display of power in the portraits that you really can't mistake. Um, it is the sense of power that the aristocracy has. Um, this painting speaks of the estate that the sitter has um, by showing the land that belongs to Charles the first. Um, it's a glamour portrait. It, he stands there with his hand on his hip, with his hand atop his, um, it's not a cane. I want to call it a stick. It's not a stick either. Um, it's a lofty pose. For one thing, it's a full-length portrait, which is something that hadn't been um, popular until Van Dyck popularizes it. Um, him standing there with his hand on his hip, his hand on his um, cane-like uh, stick, <laughs> he exudes power. Um, especially in his fine clothing and fabrics. Um, he stands in front of his horse and, of course, his servant who is attending to his horse. You notice that in every sense of the word, Charles I looks down at you. Um, as the viewer, you're coming into Charles I's space and he's asserting his dominance over you. He looks downward um, at your presence. There's a sense of superiority that the um, portraits look at you with in all of Anthony Van Dyke's work. Um, King er, Charles I rules England, uh, and he loves the land. In this portrait, he looks calm and leisurely, but dripping with power and glory. Um, Van Dyck really invents this visual language that's used, and it's repeated even in today's art. Van Dyck puts in motion the ideas of the glamour portrait um, to the point where without Anthony Van Dyck's pioneering of portraiture, even basic fashion magazines would not be the same today. Um, Anthony Van Dyck is obviously very popular in the 17th century. Um, he develops this style and it stays popular into the 1920s. John Singer Sargent was an artist that was highly influenced by Anthony Van Dyck. Um, 20th century fashion photography is totally indebted to Anthony Van Dyck's style. Um, Van Dyck really separates his subject 
from his viewer by making his subject haughty looking. Um, in fact, some modern artists or contemporary artists feel that Anthony Van Dyke was able to ac accomplish such power in his portraiture that they actually use these 17th century portraits as a pun for power. Um, the famous artist Kinde Wiley, who did the Obama portrait as Obama exited the White House, was an artist who feels that it's good to capitalize on that power. So just for a brief moment, let's take a look at the modern version of Anthony Van Dyke, Kinde Wiley. So just wanted to add this slide into the lecture this week so you could see what I was talking about when I referenced Kinde Wiley in the prior slide. Um, if you're interested in Kinde Wiley's work, there is an exercise in the Delve Deeper for you to respond to Kinde Wiley's work. To the Dutch area where art is done for Protestants and for trade. Protestant painters at this time are forced to either quit their trade as artists or begin selling their arts as a ware or a commodity that could be um, sold and traded as a good. This new system is the beginning of the modern art market. So do you see how isolated Flanders and the Dutch are from the other Protestant countries? This creates a really interesting phenomenon in art. We see these small areas um, that become more specialized in their particular skill set. We can see these artists from the Dutch world as little masters. In other words, the area seems to have regional specialties. This is Ivanitas. Um, you can see that the artist uses uh, items that would be items that were recognized as worldly items. And what I mean by that is that typically the person who was commissioning the still life would have been a person who uh, had been well-traveled. Travel in the um, 17th century was something that only people who were of upper middle class or of the aristocracy were able to do. Travel is very expensive and it takes a long time to travel um, during this time because they don't have cars, they only have or airplanes or anything, they only have uh, stagecoaches. And so if you were going to Europe, uh, well, that's a bad example because you're talking about the Dutch area, um, but if you were going to, um, well, if you were going to Austria from Italy, it would take months to get there through stagecoach. Um, and so the items that you see here, the figs and the dates and the expensive nuts would have been something that was either very expensive to have imported um, into the Dutch world, or it would have been something that they would have gathered from trade and travel. Um, the teapot that sits behind the pretzels and the bowl is a teapot that would have been acquired through travel. Um, it has a Middle Eastern root because of its long spout um, and European teapots tend to be rounder and squattier. So we know that uh, a sense of wealth is portrayed here through either trade or through travel. And also you can see symbols of the Dutch world, like the tulips in the vase. Um, you can also see, I don't know if you've ever been to the Dutch world, but um, pretzels are something that are very popular in the Bavarian part of Germany, as well as in the Dutch world. Um, and so like I've been to Germany, uh, to the Bavarian world and 
there are pretzels everywhere. Like, just like we have McDonald's, they have pretzel stands. So at any rate, um, you see a sense of wealth being portrayed here. Um, and you see a sense of uh, death being portrayed here. And what I mean by that is that you've got things that are able to perish and spoil and eventually die. Um, the flowers, um, you can see that they've already started to head south towards dying in that they're not um, all pictured straight up and down. Um, like the tulip is curved. Uh, there are several of those um, flowers that sort of look like carnations um, that sit in the front. They're not carnations. They're another type of flower. But the point is, is they, they're wilting. They're starting to die. Some of them have even lost so much um, water and uh, hydration that they've actually fallen off onto the table. And so this idea of the Vanitas was to remind the viewer of their own mortality. It was to be hung on the wall and for them to look at and be reminded that um, they had been blessed uh, with wealth and that um, their life would eventually come to an end. And so they needed to live a life that was pious so that they could go to heaven. Um, these type of still lives were something that were a product of the church not allowing art in their um, worship space. The church doesn't allow art in the worship space because they feel that um, their icons are being worshipped instead of being used to focus the um, sinner on praying. The Vanitas uh, is a work of art that has been sort of um, associated with death uh, in the European world since the 17th century. In addition to, um, I don't think this is a very great example of Vanitas in terms of representing things that the viewer would naturally identify with. Um, you know, the Vanitas had to be personalized for the household that it belonged to. So for all we know, the household that it belonged to owned a pretzel stand. And the reason it resonated with the viewer was because they own the pretzel stand and the pretzels are falling apart and going stale. I don't really know um, because we don't know the family that it belonged to. Um, additionally, the Vanitas is one of those little masters um, specialties. So Clara Peters is a Vanitas specialist, um, and that came from having those areas of specialty uh, or having the Catholic Counter-Reformation and the Protestant Reformation um, in the Dutch world. So in the Dutch world, like I showed you on the map, they're very isolated. So if they don't specialize in something, they worry about going out of business and being unrelevant. They have to find a market. Um, and in this case, Clara Peters has found that these moral inducing still lives are ones that are important um, to a group or subset of people. And because of that, she's able to find a way to sell her art. Uh, so keep that in mind as you learn more and more about the Vanitas um, in the next few slides. Okay, so this is a much better example of a vanitas. So what would happen is often artists would specialize in vanitas painting. So somebody who maybe had painted still lives for the Catholic Church now is are painting still lives um, underneath the Reformation. And they're painting these specialized still lives called vanitas. Vanitas is a still life that is meant to remind the viewer of their own immortality. Um, it's meant to remind the viewer that eventually life will end. And so it's to be hung in the home uh, to influence the viewer to be a moral upstanding citizen on good behavior. Oftentimes the Vanitas will reflect the education of the person that's commissioned it. In this case, he, the person we know reads and writes. 
because there's a sharpened quill that's been dipped in ink sitting in the front and it's in a prominent place as well as um, there's a book and a manuscript underneath the skull. Obviously the skull is the symbolism for death. Um, you can see the absence of the candle is also a symbol of mortality. Um, there's a wine glass that has fallen forward to us and it has a reflection of the window in the wine glass and this is a symbol that states that there is life after death because you can see that the window is reflected in the wine glass and it's falling towards us. Um, these Anatases had impeccable realism to them and they're just wonderful pieces of art. There are many Dutch artists that specialize specifically in Vanitas. And if you're interested in Vanitas and you haven't turned in a paper proposal, I would suggest that you consider doing Vanitas because Vanitas um, are very interesting to look at. So this particular still life still displays wealth and abundance. Um, you can see the orb that uh, reflects the room in it. Um, once, uh, I hope you recognize that as being a trademark of the Dutch area. It is one that Van Eyck pioneered um, when he reflected the entire room in the clock of the Arnolfini wedding portrait. You see a compass that sits at the front of the desk. Um, the compass represents travel and um, time. The violin uh, is something that represents um, travel and wealth, the appreciation for music. We see um, great detail paid to the surfaces of the objects. So. The orb, um, the violin, you can even see the wood grain in the sides of the violin. Um, you can see the glass that is um, toppled over towards the viewer. Um, things are set at an angle because they've figured out that putting things at an angle helps to uh, relate with the viewer more readily. You see the skull behind the violin that skull is there to remind the viewer of their own mortality. And the skull is a representation of the memento mori. Um, if you remember right, the memento mori was just an object uh, within the painting that reminds the viewer of their own mortality. Um, the reference of passage of time in this one isn't quite as apparent as it was in the very first Vanitas that we looked at. So there's not a big bouquet of flowers that's wilting and getting ready to die. Um, the message of time is sort of imbued in the objects. So you've got this compass, you've got the violin um, that takes time to play, time begins and ends with music. Um, It also warns the viewer against materialism. You do see a sense of um, the paper sort of rotting a bit below the violin, uh, but for the most part, the things that are present are things that are material. Um, it warns against being so obsessed with things that um, you get wrapped up in the worldly goods instead of the afterlife. Vanitas is a word that actually literally means empty. Um, and so it warns against the emptiness of objects and things in life. So um, flowers are an object that appear quite frequently in Vanitas paintings. Um, particularly because they uh, have a short lifespan, right? Once you pick them, they eventually wilt and die. Um, floral paintings were a distinct genre um, in the Dutch Republic. And that has to do with the fact that 
if you've ever been to the Dutch world, you know that this is an area that flowers are cultivated um, on farms. Uh, one of the highlights of going to Holland would be to see the fields of Dutch tulips. Um, Rochelle Roish was one of the main uh, painters that painted or specialized in vanitases of flowers. Roish's father was a professor of botany and anatomy, um, which might have accounted for her interest in the knowledge of plants and insects. Um, she acquires an international reputation for lush paintings um, of flowers in the still life nature. In this image, we see the lavish floral bouquet um, wilting and spilling out over top of the vase. Um, which means that it had lots of excess. The person that was able to keep them had excessive amounts of money to spend on lots of flowers. Um, that's true in our culture as well. Uh, people who have more conservative looking flowers tend to be people who aren't willing to spend money on a professional florist to decorate their homes. Um, People with lots of money spend money on professional florists to come in and decorate their homes. And so um, we see that there's a sense of wealth being portrayed here through the floral flowers. Um, Roish becomes famous for her floral paintings and still lives from about 1708 to about 1716. And she serves as the court painter for the elector Palatine. Um, he is the ruler of Palatine to the former division of Bavaria in Dusseldorf, Germany. Um, Rochelle Roish has many of these beautiful still lives. Uh, there's, they're floral paintings that uh, sort of look like a funeral arrangement. Uh, like they remind me of uh, arrangements that maybe you would take home after a funeral and then they would begin to wilt um, and die. And so, the arrangement is doing that. It's wilting and dying. Um, Rochelle Roish is famous for these paintings. In fact, if you go to any modern art museum today, you'll likely run into one of these paintings that Rochelle Roish did, um, flowers, uh, that she typically names them flower still life. Um, somewhere in between the uh, late 1600s and early 1700s. So there are also Dutch painters that produce art um, that is religious based. Often uh, it's because they've taken a trip to Italy and have seen art by artists like Caravaggio. Uh, we know that Ter Bruggen was one of these artists. Oftentimes these artists did art like this without a patron. Um, while there was not a large push for selling it, it still was produced. Um, we know that Ter Bruggen loved Caravaggio's work when he went to Italy and he was moved by it. He doesn't follow suit though with a dramatic palette um, like Caravaggio's use of tenebrism. Instead, he uses a less dramatic palette. Um, it softens the scene a bit and it creates a sense of emotional intimacy between the six men that are painted in the scene. It still has a split second timing that we identify with art, with Baroque art, um, and it carries on the Northern traditions of paying close attention to the surface textures of the clothing, especially um, of the wall behind the calling of St. Mark or behind Mark, uh, you can see the surface layer pulling off of the wall. Franz Hals was a portrait painter who was popular with the guilds and the militias of the community. Um, so he actually takes over as the portrait superstar to Van Dyck. Van Dyck's kind of in a different area in terms of geographical area. So 
they kind of work together at the same time, not certainly on the same paintings, but we can see that um, Halls has been influenced somewhat by Van Dyck because um, he's using that full-length portrait of the front man instead of the half portrait that we had been seeing during the Renaissance times. So the first person that you see up front is the front man to the militia. He's probably the new guy that's taken over the, the, um, this particular battalion. The guy that's sitting down is probably one of the retired militia men. Um, and Franz Halls does this revolutionary thing with the flags where he kind of um, creates a bookend effect to the each side of the painting with this large flag that goes to the left and the placement of the figures to the right. It's his way of kind of grouping the figures together so that they don't seem like they're scattered about the entire painting. As well as we see um, he draws attention to him in the center and he doesn't put him directly in the center so that the painting is more interesting. He draws attention to him by um, the way the swords go behind his head and the flag to his left really highlights his presence within the painting. Halls has that great attention to detail that we see that's so common in northern um, painting. He's very influenced by Van Dyck. Um, you can see the textures of the material. And of course you see evidence of the militia being well educated. There's a man reading a book to your right. Um, obviously they are a militia that protects uh, some part of the community because they have swords and flags and all of that. Franz Hals is the first to create a painting where the group of people are actually doing something other than sitting there staring for the portrait. Um, it became popular to decide how we wanted to represent a portrait of someone that became that was interesting instead of just sitting there looking at the person looking at the canvas um, Franz has decided to come up with this great um, this uh, great uh, composition that shows the people are doing something interesting like reading and talking to each other and um, just something interesting to look at. This would have been placed somewhere in a prominent uh, part of the community, probably in the town hall, so that people could actually see the painting um, in a public way. And um, it would remind them that they are well protected and to feel safe within the community. 1630. Female artists are more successful here than anywhere else in Europe. Um, she's a student of Franz Hals and she does um, subtle paintings that have social commentary to them. She likes to paint portraits of the middle class that convey personality, character, and spontaneity. Um, she has some Calvinist austerity, but also her social status is visible. Self-portraits, especially of women artists, emphasize the act of painting. Uh, it claims that she is a painter, which is a big deal because women were not often um, able to be artists. The social commentary that you see that she's currently painting has to do with a person who likely uh, plays the fiddle for money. Um, that person would have been of middle class uh, social standing. But you see that Judith Leister herself is of the upper middle class. She wears very fine fabric clothing. Um, there are many small details that pay attention to texture um, and she is presented as someone who is of upper class compared to the person that she is painting. 
So why would Judith Leister be more successful here than any other place in Europe? Keep a hold of that question. Um, it will be part of our Delve Deeper. Okay, so let's talk about Rembrandt. Um, Rembrandt is one of my absolute favorite, favorite artists, and so I could probably go on about him for days and days. Um, I know a lot about him because I have written research um, on his works of art. His work has always fascinated me in terms of the realism that he gets in the um, portraiture that he does. Uh, Rembrandt was the son of a miller. His parents owned a mill uh, in Holland. And they really wanted him to go into the family business. He turns 20 and he decides that he really does not want to go into the family business. And instead of being a miller, he really wants to go into art. And so um, he goes against his parents' wishes when he's 20 and he moves to Amsterdam and pursues his dreams of art. He is really the exception to Dutch specialization. A lot of times we look at the specializations that Dutch painters have or Dutch artists have, um, and they tend to gravitate towards one medium, towards one formula, and Rembrandt just doesn't do that. He likes to paint landscapes and portraits and seascapes and mythologies, um, and he enjoys printmaking. Um, by about 1600, there is a hierarchy of subject matter. Still lives are the most, uh, the highest form. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a hierarchy of subject matter. Um, still life sort of at the bottom, then portraiture, um, then uh, landscape, and then the highest level is narrative painting. Um, because Protestants don't have art in their church, but they do in their homes, uh, Rembrandt found a market in the Dutch world for portraiture. Um, he, Rembrandt's kind of funny. He wants the fame and fortune that Rubens earned, uh, but he really doesn't want to embrace the artistic techniques that Rubens believed in. Rubens believed in hearkening back to the classical days. He believed in resurrecting mythology. Um, he liked painting women in these voluptuous forms that were inspired from classical Rome. But Rembrandt just feels that classicism is dead. It's time to move on to more modern ways of uh, representing things. And to some degree, Rembrandt was before his time. Um, we don't see the kind of realism that Rembrandt puts into his subject matter until we get through romanticism into realism. Um, his portraits tend to be the mainstay of his career. Uh, he also is a printmaker. He marries well. Um, he marries a woman named Saskia. She is the daughter of the mayor um, and her uncle is an art dealer. And so he gets a connection for art through their marriage. Rembrandt follows a really fascinating parallel to Rubens. Um, I mentioned that he wanted the fame and fortune of Rubens, but he didn't want to travel to Italy. He never actually goes to Italy to study. He feels like he has everything he needs in Holland. Um, in 1632, he moves to Amsterdam and he buys the biggest house on the street in Amsterdam. Um, unfortunately, his financial fortune uh, is interrupted because he invests in some poor investments and um, loses everything that he has. And so he has to file for bankruptcy. And then I think shortly after that, Saskia dies in childbirth. Um, and because of that, he just really ends up in a bad position. Um, the 
art community in Holland knows that, or in Amsterdam knows that Rubens has lost his home, and he's somewhat embarrassed. Um, the main difference between him and Rubens is the classicism. Rubens falls back on that classicism and is very, um, oh, I'd say he's very diligent at using the imagery that he found in Italy, whereas Rembrandt just doesn't feel like it's necessary. We come to rely on Rembrandt to paint a sense of honesty within his subjects. Um, he doesn't change their appearance. He paints what he sees in front of him. Um, he tries to sort of get at the inner intention of the man the way Leonardo da Vinci did uh, by painting every flaw that he sees in the skin, every ounce of um, imperfection that we see in each other in society. This is another one of Rembrandt's self-portraits. Rembrandt left more self-portraits than any other artist that we have today. Um, I believe he's right neck and neck with Picasso in terms of the number of self-portraits that he creates. He goes through these periods where he's fascinated with his nose um, and he just paints parts of his face all day long. Uh, but at some point after he loses his estate in Amsterdam and his wife and his children, he begins painting portraits that um, utilize interesting uh, props. Uh, in this case, the clothing that he wears. I did a, um, a research project on this particular painting in undergrad um, because I was fascinated with how um, realistic his portraiture was. And so you see um, that he wears this strange looking cloak um, he's dressed himself up in a fanciful way to sort of thumb his nose at the people, at the Dutch people. He feels like he's been criticized for losing all of his dealings. Um, he feels like he needs to sort of, oh, be out there in order to get people's attention because he's got to somehow grab their attention that he is still a good artist even after he loses his fortune. We think he lost his fortune in the slave trade. It is likely that's what happened. The Dutch area right now is going full force into the slave trade. They've already colonized Africa um, and the African kings know that they own uh, the European co colony, European colonizers money and they don't have any way to pay off their debts. You see, the Dutch were looking for new ways to trade with other people. Um, in addition to, they had products that they needed to market to groups of people that they didn't have um, anybody to buy their goods. And so they go into Africa and into Asian areas and, and into India in the East looking for new avenues of trade. Um, some of the population fall so in love with Europeans, the European rum, um, weapons, that they don't have any way to, they rack up a debt, and then they don't have any way to pay the debt back. And because of that, they end up trading their own people in the slave trade to get the European colonizers off their backs. Eventually they become indebted to European colonizers and the European colonizers eventually enslave their people. Now, while the European colonizers do not have slaves in their own home country, they are fueling the new world. They are fueling America's um, cotton plantations. They are fueling America's plantations. And so, um, Rembrandt would have likely lost his business dealings in the slave trade in investing in those business endeavors. Um, why the slave trade was based on money. It was based on having um, 
it, it was based on having a lot of actual cash up front. Why? Because you didn't get paid for the slaves until you safely sold them in, the, in America. Um, and so a lot of people that invested in the slave trade, it was a very risky business because if for whatever reason the slaves didn't survive and the people weren't able to actually be sold in the United States, then um, your, you, you didn't get your money back. It was a very risky business, um, sort of just like gambling is today. Um, and so Rembrandt's trying to reestablish his reputation and he does so by using elaborate costuming. Uh, here you can see a close up of the detail of the uh, tunic that he wears. Uh, you can also see the impasto that we've come to associate with Rembrandt's style so much. Uh, Rembrandt likes to create these thick layering of paint on the surface of the canvas. Um, and it doesn't, he doesn't really blend it. He sort of lays it on top and allows it to read um, as it reflects, uh, the highlights reflect the light that he's looking at. So you get these um, shiny areas that you see here, the whitest of whites. You also understand that he understands the ruddiness of the complexion of the Dutch people. Um, he does a very good job at capturing um, skin tones and skin imperfections. Rembrandt's early paintings have a sense of insecurity. Um, they, they don't have as much confidence in terms of personality, in terms of um, how he pushes and pulls the medium of paint. Rubens uses his own face um, as a study to be able to paint exactly what he sees. Uh, this is a distinct expression. We call it Baroque psychology. It's the idea that he has a bi biography of his life in his paintings. Um, it's ingrained sort of in the paint. When he moves to Amsterdam, he is festooned with commissions for portraits. Okay, so this is the um, painting called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulip. And this painting is one of those um, company paintings, like the militia painting that we saw by Franz Hals. You'll notice that um, Rembrandt made his fortune based on portraiture and so this company or this doctor who practices with his other comrades wanted a portrait of him teaching his comrades and uh, him working and so Rembrandt said okay you go ahead and do a dissection or do a lesson and I will paint you so once a year, uh, criminals were allowed to donate their bodies to science if they wanted to. Um, it was supposed to help take time off of their penance in heaven. And so um, this man who was a criminal donated his body to science. And all of the doctor's company are students and they're watching um, Dr. Tulip dissect this cadaver and you see that he's got these forceps and he's holding up veins of the man's arm and the rest of the group is looking in on the lesson um curious and obviously uh raising the status of the doctor um stating that the doctor knows what he's talking about and showing that um that they're interested in what the doctor has to say. So let's look at how Rembrandt's portraiture um, grows in skill. This is probably his absolutely most famous um, 
portrait. It is called The Company of Captain Franz Bonningcock, and um, it is a militia portrait, just like the one that Franz Halls did. However, we see here that Rembrandt has really made a huge... Um, innovation here. He's showing uh, this militia as if they were uh, on any normal day. So this is what the militia does. They go around town and they make sure that everybody's safe. Um, and so this portrait will be hung in a civic area where the group meets and it will be an investment for the group to um, show the community what the group is about and what why the community should favor the group and so um, Rembrandt found it a challenge to represent the participants of the militia um, and he really wanted a selection of that spontaneous moment that Baroque paintings have. He wants um, to express to you you know, a split second timing of exactly what the militia does in a day. And so he uses the light as a dramatic um, effect. And you see that Captain Franz Bonnencock is the one who has the light dra dramatically shine shown on him. Um, and he's talking to the militia director. And then the other light that we see actually comes from this girl, this young girl back here. And I think that um, the story goes that the young girl was likely um, it, somebody that the militia had been um, trying to save or something like that. She's a ghost or an angel. Um, she's from another heavenly realm. And it kind of likens Captain Banning Hawk to um, a heavenly being. So there's some special things about this particular portrait. Um, we see that he really um, models the light subtly from the really great highlights like on Franz Bonnencock and the angel to the really dark darks and it gives a sense of space and depth within the painting. Um, The little girl that we were talking about that is the angel is actually an allegorical embodiment of Amsterdam. So um, just like uh, the Athenian Nike was the allegorical embodiment of uh, victory in Greece, um, she is the allegorical embodiment of Amsterdam. She is Amsterdam. Um, if Amsterdam was a little girl, that's what she would look like, according to Rembrandt. Um, there's a chicken dangling from her belt. It's the leg of the rooster is the emblem of this militia company, and so the pun is that Captain Banningcock's name um, is Franz Banningcock, um, which is another name for chicken, and so they think that's funny. Um, we think that Rembrandt studied a manual to get the actual um, action of the guns and the muskets and everything correct. Um, these figures are actually life-size in terms of how big this painting is. And so when you walk in to the civic hall that this painting would be hung in, you would be as tall as Captain Franz Bonnencock. So it's a really big painting. Um, When you stand in front of this painting in real life, it's as if the figures literally step out of the canvas and into our world. Um, it has to do with the way that Rembrandt's handling the light and the color. Um, there's a list of the company um, painted in the portrait and that's based on how much they paid to be painted in the portrait so if you paid more you were um, representing closer to the front and then as time goes on and you paid less you are represented further in the back um, 
this particular painting makes the rest of the paintings in the Civic Hall seem flat um, and boring. Rembrandt just really solves the issue um, that Halls had, which was, how do I make this militia come to life seem as if they're a real group of people who do real things? And so Franz Hall's paintings end up seeming insignificant compared to Rembrandt's. Um, this painting actually has an interesting life behind it. It was the victim of a horrible slashing um, and ended up needing really significant repair. If you go to the hall that it uh, lives in, its permanent home for today, um, you would see that it's had to have some repair. So it's interesting that it has um, evoked such an emotional response from viewers. So as Rembrandt's life um, in art continues, the uh, sort of undeveloped showiness and pride that he had in the beginning dissipates. Um, part of it is that he loses Saskia in childbirth. Um, the Andy loses the house in Amsterdam. Um, he eventually remarries, and he remarries, uh, the nurse of one of his children. Um, that always had some sour taste to it. And so we see that he becomes more of an internal, um, artist, one who's more contemplative, one who, um, seems to slow down and look at the moralities in life. He was one of the most innovative printmakers of the 17th century. He created about 350 etchings, um, and he extends the printmaking medium to its capacity. Uh, at this time, printmaking uh, doesn't have quite as many tricks up its sleeves in that the chemical baths that we use today for printmaking were not um, invented until post-industrial revolution. Um, and so he utilizes lots of crotch, lots of cross hatching, lots of pointillism, um, and is able to create these beautiful etchings that um, really represent a wide variety of tonalities in terms of value contrast. So you get these really rich velvety blacks that come out of it. You get this beautiful bright white um, color that comes out of the print. Uh, I said color, I meant value and highlight that comes out of the print. And you see that he focuses um, on more Christian subject matter than his own face. Um, what he did in paint on the canvas, being able to use the paint to create these painterly effects of impasto and age within the face, we see that he's able to carry over in terms of detail in his printmaking. Um, he's able to communicate through the printmaking medium a lot of different image messages. So if you look at this particular print, you see that Jesus stands in the center. He's the main place that light focuses. Um, light seems to radiate and emanate from him. Uh, this is Jesus with the sick all around him. Um, he is healing people. Um, you see to Jesus's left, the group of people that sit at Jesus's feet uh, Rembrandt represents them in these very crisp, clean lines, so you get a very clear idea of what's going on to Jesus's right hand. At his left hand, uh, Rembrandt leaves this part of the etching a little bit less finished. Um, he doesn't seem to need to describe every little detail of every person in the crowd. Um, he's able to sort of push and pull the medium to get give you more information in terms of um, 
some people and not others. Why? Uh, well, he's illustrating a story to you. So he's illustrating Christ with the sick around him. Um, the most important people that Rembrandt renders in the etching are the people at Jesus's right. No, I'm sorry. I keep getting my right and my left mixed up. It's because I'm talking about Jesus's right and left. I'm talking about the figures that are on the right hand side, uh, your right hand side of the print. Um, these crisp figures that have very strong detailed line work that we can easily see what's going on at the feet of Jesus. These are the ones who Let's move on to Rembrandt's The Three Crosses. I know the last um, slide I kind of faded out at the end. I was trying to trim the end of my wordiness out. So um, just to let you know, it wasn't a mistake. I was trying to um, sort of be a little less winded. At any rate, um, The Three Crosses, Rembrandt utilizes a similar uh, technique in terms of clarity. Uh, in his figures, you see some of the figures are very crisply defined and others of them are less so. This is Jacob von Reisdale's view of Harlem from the dunes at Overseen. Oh, I'm sorry. Jacob von Reisdale's view of Harlem from the dunes at Overeen. Um... It's a landscape painting that was very popular in the time of Risedale's. He is painting the Holland, well, he's painting uh, Harlem, which is a town, a Dutch province. Um, for one thing, Von Risedale was a specialist in landscape painting. It was his little duchy master was landscape painting. Um, he had many pupils. Uh, and he was a very popular artist in uh, the Dutch areas. Um, the landscape is a popular theme, but nationalistic pride in the country is also very popular. Um, the area that he's painting is the area that is flatland right outside of Harlem. Um, some of the symbols that we see in the painting are the church towers and windmills um, that are in the distance. You can also see people uh, drying linen on the grass. They're stretching these large uh, spanses of fabric across the landscape. This was one of the... Um, prominent businesses of the Dutch. I don't know um, how many of you know much about Dutch trade, but the Dutch were responsible for um, fabric houses. Um, they were heavily into the textile mills. And so um, this scene is one in which the linen has been bleached and they're drying it in the sun. The linen naturally has sort of a grayish color whenever it's created and then they bleach it so it gives you this nice white fiber in which you could print um, a colorful print on. Holland has a unique situation in the Protestant Reformation. It's sort of in this tiny corner of Europe. Uh, there are only seven provinces of um, the area that are coastal. And they have the best harbors and port towns in all of Europe. Uh, there is no patronage in art at this point. Protestants believe that the images of the church are idolatry. And so because of this, as we have talked, um, landscapes are a popular theme. Um, in this area, the uh, loomingness of aristocracy, there is none to speak of. Um, the power in this area are by these small duchies. Um, and oftentimes the duchies had links to the church. So it is possible that the Catholic church that looms in the distance is a symbol of threat. It's also possible that the Catholic church that looms in the distance is uh, maybe looked at as a possible art 
Avenue. Um, this is an image of middle class uh, merchant investors. Um, the harbor towns in Europe, in Northern Europe, replace Venice as one of their great importers of European goods and exports. Um, we see things coming in and out of Europe through towns like Harlem um, from all over the world. Ivory from Africa, tea from Asia, and spices. Um, the money went into the hand of the multitudes of investors that invested in the shipping companies. Um, and this was the first time that capitalism really fuels life. Uh, all of the middle class citizens bought art to hang on their walls. The middle class were not used to commissioning art. And it took artists time to figure out what they wanted in the new art market. Um, now, artists make paintings in advance and hope that they will sell in galleries, um, which leads to these little Dutch masters that specialize in things like Von Rysdale did um, in terms of landscape painting. We call them little Dutch masters because they specialize in one subject area. So the other masters that we looked at were the Vanitases. Um, we looked at, we're looking at the landscape paintings. Um, Rembrandt was a master of portraiture. Uh, Franz Hals, also a master of portraiture. So with that line of thinking, one of our other major specialists is Vermeer. Vermeer specializes in genre scenes, scenes of everyday life that were very popular with the Dutch. Um, his art in particular was not popular with the Dutch. They felt like his work was harsh and crude. Uh, this opinion could have partially come, came from the use of a machine that he used called the camera obscura. Vermeer lives in a time of intense war between the Protestants and the Catholics. That's one thing I really want to be sure that we have covered in this lesson fully is this war between the Protestants and the Catholics is not simply a conflict. People are dying over this issue. Major countries go to war um, because of it. This is the challenge of the divine right to rule. Um, I don't think that Martin Luther intended that whenever he first wrote the treatise on um, the Catholic Church, that he stable, that he nails the 95 Theses to the wall or to the door of the church. I don't think that he intended for that. I think he just wanted to see a change in the ways of the church. And in turn, that led to a change in power differential. Vermeer's paintings try to suggest an order and peace. He wants to suggest an antidote to the chaos that Vermeer lives in. They force us and stop to look because he is so very good at looking. Um, I would say this is the one place that Northern European artists really shine. Um, it's in looking. They are very good at picking apart these minute little details, just like Van Eyck is really good at surface detail. Vermeer is good at detail. He's good at crispness. He's good at perfect forms. Um, the camera obscura helps Vermeer look more. He follows the typical hallmark of artists in the north. He loves texture and records things so accurately that it seems as if he's painting a photograph of his subject matter. This is the camera obscura that Vermeer uses. It's Latin, it comes from dark chamber, and it's an optical device that led to photography and eventually the actual camera. The device consists of a box or a room with a hole in one side. It allows him to record what he sees by tracing it on a piece of paper. In turn, this technique flattens out the spatial relationship between objects. So a lot of times in art school, they would tell us that they wanted us to go sketch from real life. They didn't want us sketching from pictures. And it's because pictures tend to flatten out the space. They don't have any way to communicate the depth of field. 
And so they make objects that are close to the camera very large, and objects that are far away from the camera seem smaller than they should be. Um, the people of his time don't know why they do not like his work. They just know that they don't. And this is Johannes Vermeer's Woman Holding a Balance from 1664. It is oil on canvas. It is the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. If you ever get the opportunity to go to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., I highly recommend that you do so. Um, she is Dutch, and you see her balancing the scale. Um, she's weighing uh, gold. And you see the light that comes through the window that shines on her wimple. The light that comes through the window highlights the textures of her garment. Um, you can see how the light catches, or how her wimple catches the light, almost to the point where it's see-through. Her face feels so very realistic. I could imagine, um, feeling her soft porcelain cheek. It's so tiny and delicate and fair and um, uh, very well described in terms of flesh tone. Uh, she wears a jacket with fur. Um, we understand the texture of the fur, so much so that if we took a quick glance, we might think that this was a photograph. Uh, you see that the table comes directly out at you and there's a chair that sits at the end of the table. Uh, there is a piece of fabric draped around the chair and the end of the table. And it provides sort of a, mm, sort of a way to compare the brightness of the gems that she has spilling out of the money box. Behind her, you see a religious painting on the wall. Um, with looks like the assumption of Jesus. This is the allegory of the art of painting. It's a painting that has symbols of create of a creative act. Um, it is a self portrait of Vermeer painting a portrait um, and just like all Dutch painting uh, we see lots of symbolism in it um, this is a symbol of the creative act uh, the model the costume the laurel wreath the model holding an instrument um, it doesn't seem to be a 17th century piece the painting um, seems wonky because Vermeer is using the camera obscura um, that puts this painting really ahead of time. He creates it so that it seems as if there's a scene going on behind the curtain and you are the peaker of a private moment between the model and the artist who is painting. Um, the muse is history. The map has a large crease in it, uh, which is so clear that it seems as if we could touch it and know its texture. The composition compels the viewer to keep our view within the frame. Um, he does that by using this curtain to sort of allow us to peek in. The color is amazing. It's rich and well saturated. So much so that um, Vermeer's tights seem to pop out at us because of how chromatic they are in the composition. Everything is mapped out. Nothing is left to chance. Uh, Vermeer has a very technical style that we associate with the art of the North. This is Vermeer's view of Delft. Um, you can see his attempt here at landscape painting that he's not as good at as he is the genre paintings. Um, you can see that he's recording uh, the houses that are across the bay. Uh, this area of the world has lots of water. Uh, their canal system is very sophisticated. 
Uh, and a lot of their um, trade comes through ports in the waterways. Uh, it really highlights why his work was not popular with people in his time. And that is because you can see how tiny the people are compared to how large the houses are. Um, they're just not proportionate. Uh, if you were trying to take a picture, this is exactly what the picture would look like in terms of comparing the people to the houses. The bottom line was Vermeer was just ahead of his time. Um, he was way ahead of his time and his paintings did not seem to appeal to the Dutch people because he was using technology that they weren't used to seeing being used in creating these types of works of art. So this is Jan Steen. Jan Steen is another of the genre painters. Um, your book makes a point that uh, Jan Steen tends to uh, paint with wider brush strokes than Vermeer, um, which I guess is true. Uh, he definitely has more of a painterly feel to the textures of the fabrics um, in his work. Uh, Jan Steen marries a landscape painter's daughter. Uh, that was his first marriage, and his family was Catholic. They ran a tavern, um, and his second wife worked in a meat market. They had eight kids, um, and he died at age 53. He is distinctive as a Dutch artist uh, because he contrasts with Vermeer. Um, Vermeer is very sy uh, systematic. He's very tightly rendered. His work is very um, surface detailed like Van Eyck. Whereas Jan Steen's work um, has more of a satirical vein to it. Um, it's done sort of in the onlooker feel in terms of the way he probably felt most of his life being an onlooker as a tavern owner. He often saw endless amounts of lively um, oh, lively chaos in his world. Um, here you see the Feast of St. Nicholas. Um, the Feast of St. Nicholas would be, have been a Christmas type celebration. Uh, Steen paints over 800 works, but he never achieves financial success. Uh, Mostly, I suppose, because he was mostly painting for uh, preaching purposes to create moral stories and visual visuals that represented the proverbs that were part of his world. Um, his paintings of children are especially remarkable. Uh, he captures not only their childish style, uh, but sort of their fleeting moods, their expressive manners. Um, he uses these more rapid and fluid brush strokes than we've seen of the genre painters thus far. Um, Steen has... Uh, use lots of Dutch imagery in here to represent things that Dutch use, the Dutch used um, as moral stories and messages that we as onlookers, because we live in the day and age that we do, don't really get. Um, for example, this basket that someone has knocked over that is rolling all over the floor that's about excess, it's about the morality of using what you have. Um, this shoe that is left unturned has a moral message as well. Uh, so I'm gonna put this in the uh, Delve Deeper activities. If you're interested in Jan Steen's messages, um, maybe you will research some of the moral symbols within the work of art. So King Louis XIV moves the royal court to Versailles, um, in, that's just outside of Paris. He feels like he needs a proper setting for an absolute monarch. Um, 
because he thinks he's the Sun King, the interior of the building has axes that all meet at his bedroom. Um, done under the umbrella of the Royal Academy of Arts. He has a, the Royal Academy of Arts is a strong academy in Paris. Um, one that if you're going to be a successful artist, you really have to attend. Um, and so he works in conjunction with the Royal Academy of Arts to employ several artists. Um, the artists that he employ are the very first interior designer, the very first landscape designer, or I'm sorry, I misspoke, the very first landscape designer. Um, the idea behind the landscape is that he wants to have nature as something that he can control. Right now they are at the brink of the Industrial Revolution, and so nature is something that if he can figure out how to control nature, he's already, the technology of the world has already figured out controlled um, urbanization. And so controlled nature becomes a goal for him. Uh, the controlled nature comes through fountains and through the landscape architecture. Uh, he basically builds a whole new capital. In the 1600s, that was 2 million people that lived there at Versailles um, and in surrounding areas serving King Louis. Um, the building itself is a third of a mile long, and the entire grounds are visible from space. Louis Laveau and Jules Hardon Massa. Um, are the architects that design the Palace of Versailles. Um, Louis XIV basically builds a satellite city and all the nobility have to move there. They move there to serve him. Um, I mentioned to you that the palace um, had about two million people that were there uh, serving uh, King Louis. And I mentioned to you that King Louis tried very hard to control the nature that the grounds were on. What you're looking at here is a view from the garden reflecting pools onto the facade of the palace. Um, Andre de Nautre was the first landscape designer in history. Um, he designed the entire setting for the building. The, um, cus the cruciform is a reflecting pool and uh, they had an allegorical program to the design, meaning there was um, conceptual ideas that went into the design. Uh, the bigger point, though, is that this is a true Baroque building in that the facade undulates in and out with the viewer's space. It might be a little bit hard to see uh, because what you're looking at is a picture of it but if you look across the span of the front of the building, you see that parts of the facade pop out and are um, more raised than other parts of the facade. That's what makes this a true Baroque building. Because of that um, jetting out into the viewer's space, the viewer feels like the building um, becomes part of their space. The facade, the Renaissance time, was very static. It was very flat. And so the fact that the Baroque are pushing that and making it so that the facade comes out towards the viewer gives the viewer a relationship with the facade. What you're looking at here is an example of the palace fountains. Um, the fountains dot the entire party and they have a lot of allegorical meaning. If you look um, closely at the picture on the left, you can see the different sculptural figures that make up that allegorical meaning. Um, there's a reflecting pond that has a fountain in the middle of it. Um, it's Apollo and his chariot. 
And what you're looking at right here, 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 here is um, the horses and the chariot. It, the, um, founds are situated in a way that when the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west, the fountains are on a program that um, display water based on the rising and setting of the sun. So not only does Jules Harden Masson um, design the exterior of the building, he also designs the complete interior. Um, you can see the interior hall of mirrors here. The hall of mirrors was an important part of uh, the ritual that Louis the Fourteenth carried out every single day. Every single day, the palace um, servants or the people who were living in the palace that were hired to serve King Louis the Fourteenth would make a ritual out of dressing him. They would dress him for the sole purpose of him promenading from one end of the Hall of Mirrors to the other. So he would start at uh, the east entrance and promenade to the west end, to the west end of the um, hall. Right now, the way you see it, uh, the candelabras and things have been electrified, but back in the day, they would have been lit by candlelight. Um, the Hall of Mirrors has an entire row of windows on the uh, left side and on the the sun is reflected from the mirror. So the hall is this brilliant display of light that comes through. And Louis the Fourteenth, like I said, would promenade from one end of the hall to the other. Um, getting dressed was a ritual, and uh, promenading from one end to the other uh, and of the hall. He would then get to the other end, and then he would have an entire ritual of de-dressing and going to bed, getting up the next day, and starting it all over again. This room is truly a magnificent room. It is truly a Baroque room. It has lots and lots of detail. You can see the crown molding at the ceiling. Um, you can see how the room has a sense of sculptural feel to it. Um, even though the sculptural feel projects from the walls. Um, same with the facade of the building. You get that sculptural feel because the facade jets out into your space. Even within the interior rooms, um, the decorations in the room jet out into the viewer's space. Uh, you get engaged columns, um, but these moving candelabras that you see uh, in front of you also help that. The ceiling has a, a painting on it from one end to the other and is painted um, in that uh, illusionistic fresco style that we talked about when we talked about Bernini. Um, you can see how the frames look as if they are set on top of the painting. Some of them are painted and some of them are true sculptural frames. A program of light that comes in and out of this room creates an incredible display of splendor each day. So this is the Queen's bedroom. Um, she slept separate from King Louis and it runs along the east-west axis. Um, it has a room adjacent to it that intersects with King Louis XIV's bedchamber. So they each have their own bedchamber, but then they have a room in the middle that they both share. Um, because he thinks he's Apollo on Earth, uh, as he rises, so does the nation of France. All the people wait for him to get up in the morning, just like we wait on the sun. Um, the aristocracy was expected to follow him around. This was not a palace of pleasures. It was about organization, discipline, and duty to the state. 
Um, Louis the Fourteenth grows the country, and there's a time of war. Um, there are halls of peace and war within the palace, um, which are linked together by the Hall of Mirrors that we just looked at. So I wanted to tell you just a little bit more about the Hall of Mirrors in terms of the candelabras and things. Um, like I said in the last slide, there was a peace room and a war room at the... Um, that were linked together by the Hall of Mirrors. Um, the crystal floor chandles that you see here were movable. You could move them uh, around as you needed light. And they were originally made of silver. Um, when Louis XIV promenades from one end of the hall to the other, um, the mirrors reflect the light um, and in Louis XIV's eyes, they reflect the glory of the sun god, which is him. So the light, in his opinion, is the reflection of his glory. Um, he did do a lot for France. He expanded the empire, or the rule of France. Um, but as time, well, and he puts in motion the Royal Academy of Arts, which is really, really strong um, when he leaves office. He was married to Marie Antoinette. Um, and, you know, she was famous for the um, let them eat cake uh, saying, um, because the palace was very grand and very expensive, and basically Louis XIV, uh, taxed the entire uh, country of France to pay for the building of the palace. Um, when he leaves office, uh, Marie Antoinette is beheaded and um, he is assassinated as well and um, the whole country goes into revolution. But during the time that he rules, um, the aristocracy and the country, um, in terms of uh, an army and all of that, is very strong. It's the people that live in the urban cities that are very uh, challenged economically and weak economically. But obviously, as a people, they're very strong because they're able to overthrow the government. So at the end of the Baroque period, an artist named Nicolas Poussin and Claude Gully um, invent a new language for painting. Um, it's called French Classicism. When we think of Classicism, we usually think of uh, themes that harken back to uh, t the time of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. But in this case, French classicism uses those type, uses imagery from ancient Greece and ancient Rome and pulls from myths about ancient Greece and ancient Rome uh, as language for painting subject matter. Uh, I want you to learn more about French classicism and about Nicolas Poussin. Um, and so because we didn't cover it strongly in the Baroque, I want you to um, follow the link to the next slide to a YouTube video and learn more in depth about Poussin and Claude Gally. Um, I will tell you what I know about the two paintings that are in the PowerPoint that um, are done by Nicolas Poussin, but I really want you to have a deeper understanding, so that YouTube video will help you. It's a Khan Academy video. Um, I usually don't like to use those. In fact, I would much rather tell you what I know over doing Khan Academy. But this particular one is a conversation between two professionals about how important Poussin and Claude Gally are. Therefore, I think that it's definitely worth um, listening to.